Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. This is the number one daily radio show for realtors looking for a no BS, authentic, real-time coaching experience. What's really working in today's market, how to generate more leads, make more money, and have more time for what you love in your life. And now your hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. As promised, we have a podcast today that is going to be perfect for all of you who are ready to dominate your fourth quarter and build massive momentum into next year. Today's podcast is called Dominate Your Fourth Quarter, the Realtor's Ultimate Productivity Handbook. So we're going to be going through a lot of very specific points. You're going to, this is actually a bit of a form. You know, we're going to be telling you to do some real math and set some real goals. And this should be fun because it's going to open up your mind to the fact that your new year has actually officially started. And that's one of the greatest I think uh, secrets, if you want to, you know, with air quoting the word secret, but one of the greatest secrets in any business, but especially the real estate industry is the worst time of the year to be building momentum is the beginning of the year. The best time of the year to be building, building momentum into the following year is now fourth quarter. You are there. It is October. You should be working on actually building up your momentum into next year. We're in, we're going to give you an exact plan how to do it. So open your mind to the idea that you shouldn't just be coasting mentally and emotionally the rest of this year, because then what's going to happen is you're going to suffer financially. Actually open your mind to the fact that this is the best and dare I say easiest time of year to build momentum because why all your competitors are decorating their Christmas trees and delivering pumpkin pies. They're not really engaged. They're not really drilled down. They're allowing some of the greatest listings to, uh, you know, expire. All this happens only this time of year. So be excited, be motivated, but absolutely take action. So Julie, we're going to be going through all of our points today. And remember, you're going to want these points. You're going to want our notes and they're available for everyone at harrisrealestatedaily.com. That is our newsletter, harrisrealestatedaily.com. We'll deliver all of our notes as well as that day's podcast and a lot of other unique content directly to your inbox. So subscribe now harrisrealestatedaily.com and it's free. Just drop in your email address and you have to confirm the subscription in your uh, actual email and you're off to the races. So if you want today's notes, which I know you will, you know what to do. Subscribe to harrisrealestatedaily.com. All right. So again, we're talking about killing it fourth quarter. You're going to start with a couple of mindset points and figuring out how many work days you actually have left this year. Right now, there are 64 weekdays, i.e. work days, between when we record this and December 31st, the end of the year. Now, you're going to, from that, subtract two days for Halloween. Whether you have kids or not, people don't work the day before and the day of Halloween usually. Two days at least for Thanksgiving, one week for Christmas, and two days before New Year's Day. Adjust accordingly, but I would say that's the least Even though I know you're motivated, you work every single day of the year, not everybody you're trying to motivate is going to give you appointments. Well, here's the visualization for this. And this is something we've done for decades, literally with our coaching clients, because everyone wants to have and deserves to have downtime to spend with your family and whatnot. And even if you want to work over the holidays, your buyers and your sellers don't. So, you know, you got to schedule in some downtime and, uh, you know, give yourself a little bit of a break, but you'd still have to be productive. So go get a calendar, print, find one online, have chat GPT, make you one. And then you literally, it'll, it'll produce a, uh, a calendar for you. And then mark out the days that you know, you're not going to be working with a red X or an X. And then mark the days you are going to be working with say a green dollar sign. And as Julie said, if you work backwards from say, you know, December to October, you're, you know, let's be honest, December it's hit and miss. You really just don't know, you know, how many actual days you're going to be working. Maybe you're going to take two weeks off around Christmas, right? And then you're going to go all the way back to November or, and you know, if you're listening to it, you know, October 3rd, you're going to be going into the future in November. Well, there's going to be two weeks around Thanksgiving that a lot of people just are kind of disengaged. And then oddly enough, the end of October, Halloween has become a bit of a holiday as well for a lot of people. Well, then there's going to be the parties you're going to be going to. Then there's the family things you're going to be going to be going to. So you've got to create a realistic plan of actually how many days you're going to be working. And on the days you're going to be working, follow your plan to actually get results. Um, So again, I'm going to give you guys a little advanced coaching. Some of the best times of the year to uh, hunt expired listings are right now. Because when you have um, essentially your competitors are out to lunch or, you know, at a Christmas party, they're not going to be uh, calling expired. They're not going to be really doing any productive lead generation. 
and you're going to see a lot of expireds that are going to happen over the week. So like the best time of year to hunt expireds is this time of year because there's a lot of end of the months and starts of the months that fall over weekends when it's easy to get people at home when you're calling them. And also when you're calling them and it's the end of the month and the start of the month and it's over a holiday week, you're always going to get them at home. So in other words, it's easier to make contacts this time of year and you have less competition. So be excited about the opportunities that are only available at this level this time of year. Yes. And we always would do that. And we always set ourselves up for a great spring. Okay. So when you have taken your calendar, as Tim suggests, and you cross out the days that you know you're not going to be working, include your ski trip, include all of the things. For most of you, that leaves you around 50 days to be productive before the year turns over. Now, for some of you, it's less than that. The calendar tells you you've got 90 days left. But when you look at work days, you might have 40, 45, 50, somewhere well, in there. Let, let's just do it just standing you know, here by each other. So you have in October... Let's assume that, you know, there's going to be some work stoppage that's going to happen at the end of October. Yeah. So you have three productive weeks. And again, let's just assume you only want to work five days of the week. So that's 15 days. Mm -hmm. In November, let's assume it's the same. Take the whole week of Thanksgiving out. That's what I that it meant. Yeah. So another yeah. 15 days in November. So now you're up to 30 days. Yep. And then December, what? Two weeks? It may be, I mean, realistically, that's yeah. probably right. So it's what, you know, Julie was saying 53 days. But for a lot of you, it's probably going to be more like, 40 days. Yeah, less than a month and a half of work right. between now and the end of the year. So, so. There's, there's 90 days left this year, but realistically, you're only working half of them. And that's if you don't get sick, if your kids don't get sick, if you don't have a blizzard some of you have to look exactly. forward to, right? Okay, so obviously it's time to get serious about your fourth quarter. On today's podcast, we're going to start with a checkup on your mindset and then help you create some action steps that will lead you to a super hyper productive finish to this year. So first, and Tim told you how to get these notes, so this is a kind of a workshop. The first question is, it's December 31st. Let's just fast forward. Of this year, you are looking back on the year. What are three things you're most proud of accomplishing in the category of your business? And what are three things you're most proud of accomplishing in your personal life? And don't just jot down, you know, what came in 30 seconds of thinking about it. Be introspective. Think about it. Don't be multitasking take it seriously. That's the first question. Well, so like if we were on the beach together, this is how I present it sometimes when Julie and I are doing webinars and other training. I will ask the question. So I want you to imagine that you flew down to visit with Julie and I in Puerto Rico. We're sitting on the beach. The beach is called um, Barlavento. Yes. <laughs> okay. We're sitting on the beach together and we're enjoying each other's companies and it's just a beautiful day. The breeze is blowing perfectly. The kite surfers are out there doing their thing. And I ask you the question, like, what is it in the last 12 months, you're, we're having this meeting at the end of this year, what are the, what are the you know, top three things that you're most proud of having accomplished uh, in the last 12 months in your business and personal life? Now, I've done this just as I've described it, but most of the times I've done it um, on coaching calls. And what I find almost always is nobody has clearly defined things that they're proud of. And even if this is true, even with like people that are frankly doing very well financially, they still don't have very clearly defined things. Like I, so what is it that you're most proud of having accomplished the last 12 months personally? And they'll make big general statements. Well, I had a better relationship with my dog or, you know, things like that, but they're not real specific drill down things that they've actually said. I set this goal for this to happen and it actually happened. But, you know, you can then expand that to financial. You know, you can expand that to business. Whatever it is, what are the top three things in your business you're most proud of having accomplished in the last 12 months? And I'm asking you, dear listener, to answer the question now. And what are the top three things you're most proud of having accomplished in your personal life in the last 12 months? And you can, again, you can throw financial or physical or mental or emotional or all the rest of it. How, whatever sparks the answers to the questions. And don't be surprised because it's actually abnormal to have a clearly defined answer to the question if you've never been asked it like that. So then the next question is, you know, because you're probably struggling to come up with an answer to the first question. So I want you to now imagine that it's at the end of next year. We're sitting in these exact same seats on this exact same beach, enjoying this exact same experience. And I'm going to ask you again, you know, 12 months from now, what are the things you're most having, most proud of having accomplished in your business and personal life? And then you're going to actually start real, setting some realistic, you know, having some realistic goals that you're going to be proud of. Being proud of a goal is one of the ways that subconsciously you start defining what it is that you really want to focus on because it'll be something that you're proud of having accomplished that probably required doing what you didn't want to do when you didn't want to do it at the highest, uh, highest level. That could be, for example, on the physical side, maybe you lost 25 pounds. On the you know, spiritual side, maybe you have the goal of reading the Bible. 
Maybe you had the goal of, you know, taking 25 listings the entire year or selling a hundred homes or saving, you know, a hundred thousand dollars or paying off some debt, or you had a goal of going to Europe. You have the goal of you guys get the point. So that's really what you need to start thinking, wrapping your mind around is, and you don't have to have a million different goals. What are the things that you want to be most proud of 12 months from now, having accomplished in your business and personal life? Think about that, dear listener, and really drill down and define what those things are. Part of what will help you with that is question number two. If today were December 31st and you're looking back now, what would your woulda, coulda, shoulda list look like? These are probably the things that you're procrastinating, the things that maybe you wish you would be proud of that you've got to fix. And do that in the business end of things as well as the personal end. Now we're going to get into the weeds a little bit about how to set goals, but also basically how to build action plans around those goals. Then that gets into point number three. Julie? Point number three, what steps must you immediately implement to have a super grateful December 31st? What must you stop doing in some cases and what must you start doing? Are you running your business on luck and hopium or on a proactive lead generation plan that produces predictable and duplicatable results. This would be a good place to remind all of you that, especially if you're in premier coaching, this is the perfect time of year to be dusting off your real estate treasure map. And the real estate treasure map is in the first level. It is free uh, when you join premier coaching and it is a fill in the blank business and life plan. Now we are in the midst right now, literally of rewriting the real estate treasure map. We're updating it. We're including some new plans and things of that nature. But as is on the website, when you join premier coaching, it is a perfect thing for you to be doing with your spouse, your partner, and it's going to set business. It's going to help you to go through the mental and emotional exercise of setting business and profession and, uh, and personal goals. And they're around the five areas of life with Julie's about to present to you now. But if you want a template and how to create an actual plan, it's waiting for you over in premier coaching. All you've got to do is go to premiercoaching.com or text the word premier to four, seven, three, seven, two. And remember when you log in the first level, look for the, uh, it's right at the top. Look for the thing called your business plan, real estate treasure map, and download that. I believe it's 63 pages. Yep. So, you know, make sure you have plenty of paper, but that is your absolute first thing you should do when you become a premier coaching client. Just go to premiercoaching.com or text the word premier to 47372. Julie, point number four. And point number four is indeed an excerpt from the real estate treasure map. And that goes like this. The difference between a dream and a goal is that a dream is... I'm sorry, a goal is a specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. That's those words spell out SMART to help you remember. S-M-A-R-T, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. It's also written down and has a plan attached to it. So in coaching, in the Harris Rules book, in the treasure map, We teach you how to set goals in five areas of life. And because we're talking about fourth quarter, you can do that just for fourth quarter, but use these five areas, physical, financial, family, spiritual, and educational. Now it's a good uh, place for me to drop in here. If you don't have like different parts of your stages of your life, I hate the word stages, frankly, but just at different times in your life, you're going to be more focused on specific uh, categories of goals. For example, maybe you are wanting to get your financial house in order. So you're going to be putting a lot of emphasis on financial. You're going to be paying off the debt. You're going to be saving the money. You're going to be building your net worth. You're going to be doing all the things, right? Well, and those, and when you're really focused on that, and maybe that's going to be a three to five year goal, you're really trying to set some specific financial goals to give yourself some financial security and sense of freedom. Well, there are going to be some other aspects of your, of the five categories of life, which might be neglected because you have to put more effort towards making money, saving money, investing money. So maybe you're not spending as much time on spiritual, but at a different stage in your life, when you're older, you might want to, now that you got your financial house in order, you might be focusing more on spiritual goals. You guys get it? So there's no such thing as balance is what I'm trying to help you understand. There's no such thing as equal balance between physical, financial, family, spiritual, and educational goals. And again, you're going to be focusing on different things with different levels of emphasis at different points of your life. That's right. It's more important to focus on what's truly critical in each of those categories than to try and say, okay, I'm going to have three goals physical, three goals financial. It doesn't work that way. It's what's most important to you at the time that it's important to you in your life, which is right now. Right. Maybe you're younger and you want to start your family. Maybe you're married and you want to have a kid. Those are family goals. Maybe you're pregnant and you're going to have a baby soon. I got Family and physical goals. Exactly. (laughs) I got news for you. You're going to be focusing on the baby when the baby arrives. Indeed. Whatever goals you think you were going to accomplish are now going to be dominated by a little baby. So, I mean, these types of things are all the, you know, it's all part of the beauty of life, but give yourself a little bit of a break and understand that myth in any aspect of life, uh, the myth of, uh, is of balance in any aspect, 
aspect of life, if you try to have too much balance, if you focus on that being your prime directive, you will actually get yourself out of balance because you'll always be wondering, yeah. why am I not spending enough time on this other category of life? Uh, it's because you can't because it's not the time of life for you to be thinking about those other things with such level of intensity. Right, exactly. So we're going to take financial because that's the easiest one of the five areas. That's the one that's consistent throughout your life. <laughs> it's easy because you can, you know, effort equals results and you can track it with real numbers. It's definitive, right? It follows right. the smart rules. So we're going to do a micro goal for fourth quarter, and then we're going to think bigger with a second goal. So the first one is a financial goal. Let's say the goal is to save six months of personal overhead and pay cash for a fantastic Christmas. Well, first you got to be specific. How much is that? Maybe your monthly personal overhead is five grand a month and you want to spend $2,500 on Christmas. Adjust accordingly. So let's say that you need $2,500 to pay for that month plus the 20, uh, the five, I'm sorry, $5,000 to pay for your overhead and $2,500 for Christmas. You need $7,500 in addition to paying your bills. How many transactions is that for you? Well, most of you have at least an average commission of $9,000 after paying costs. That's based on an average sale price in the country of right around $400,000 times the average commission minus about 20% of costs you should be able to meet or exceed that goal on an additional transaction. You want to pay cash. You don't want to charge all those Christmas presents. You want to pay your monthly overhead. You need one additional deal. And I can guarantee most of you, unless you got your license yesterday, that extra deal is probably lurking simply in your lead follow-up. You do this as part of the real estate treasure map. You're going to add up, you know, you're going to have a financial coming to Jesus session with your finances and maybe your, your, your spouse. And you're going to write down really what, uh, are your true monthly expenses. Now you know what your monthly expenses are. Don't forget all the other things, the taxes and the, all the rest of it, right? Then you're going to come up with a different category of the things that are you know, optional, but not really. Vacations and doing things that really make it so that life has a lot of you know, color. And, you know, it's fun, right? Uh, so whatever those things are, those things are all, you can all attach a dollar sign to all of those things. And then there's going to be a savings goal. Now, what Julie and I have always done is we've always put savings first and then we've you know done the other things second, but maybe you're not wired the same way. It doesn't matter. The point is, is there are different buckets in which you're going to be able to you know de clearly define where the money is going to go. And then what you do is you figure out how many transactions you actually have to close to meet or exceed whatever your goal is. And that's where things get magical because what you're going to discover is, let's say, for example, based on what you want to earn next year to accomplish all your goals, you need to earn $250,000, but your average commission is $10,000. Well, you're going to have to sell 25 houses to earn $250,000 that's going to be, you know, meeting or exceeding whatever your goals are that you had set for that particular goal or that particular year. But now you have a clearly defined number that we can then create a more robust business plan around. That's right. Because it's not enough to just say, gosh, I got to earn more. I got to do more deals. I need to raise my average sale price. Okay. So nobody's ever said the opposite of that. I want to earn less and I want to do fewer deals, but it's not definitive. How many more deals and why based on what? That's what the treasure map does for you. And unlike a job in real estate, you can actually adjust your goals and your aspirations higher or lower for that matter, and then adjust accordingly the number of transactions you're going to do. Based on your skills and your schedule and what you're willing to do. Versus if you had a job, you have to basically plan your life around how much money you're making from the paycheck. There's a total and complete level of freedom that is only offered when you're you know, in real estate because you can essentially dream big and actually accomplish even bigger. But you've got to start out with having realistic drilled down goals. That way, when I'm asking you in 12 months, what are the things you're most proud of having accomplished? You'll be able to clearly answer that question. Very well put. So that brings us to point number five. What production goals are necessary to support your goals in the five areas of life, in addition to paying for your normal personal and business overhead? How many new listings must you take? How many actual closed sales? How many buyers are you going to put under contract? Do you currently have inventory that you need to price reduce? What about your lead follow-up? What about appointment set? You've got to figure out what it's going to actually take in order for you to meet or exceed those new goals. That should, again, go back to the treasure map. Okay. Now, now here, here's, I'll go to this part. Okay. So the, here's really gets down to the essence of the real estate treasure map. It drills down to something that we call lovingly the magic number. And the magic number of, uh, it's essentially, there's uh, the easiest way to understand it is it's the number of closings you need every single month to meet your financial goals. So let's just use round numbers of 30,000. Let's say for you to have a fantastic year and to meet or exceed your financial goals, you need to earn $30,000 a month, right? And let's say your average commission is 
is $10,000. So you need to have, you know, look, 30,000 pays the taxes. It's setting aside some money for retirement. It's, you know, going on a great vacation. It's donating money to your, you know, you guys get it. This is going to check all the boxes. And I realize some of you, the number is far greater than that. And a lot of you, it's far lower than that. Adjust accordingly. Well, now you know that you need to have three closings per month with your average commission being $10,000. Again, you'll have to know what your average commission is uh, in order for you to meet or exceed what your financial goals are for yourself. So here's where the, here's what the magic number is. And this is the way you can, and I personally, when I'm coaching agents, this is, I do it based on the number of listings. Now, Julie has a different approach where she'll do it the number of transactions, but the number of listings is going to give you more of a drilled down handle on basically getting a predictable result. So if you need to have three closings per month, don't focus on 30 because that might feel a little threatening or, or daunting, you know, um, you know, if you have to have three closings per month, you're going to have to have end up for the year having 36 closings. That seems like a lot, right? Like, oh my gosh, you've never done this much, but here's what I want you to focus on. Focus on say five or six listings. Because if you have five or six listings at all times, you're going to have automatically, because the market's going to absorb and the, you know, the buyers are going to buy at least half of that inventory. And that's if you're in a buyer's market. If you're in a balanced market, buyer's market, you're going to have half your listings sell every single month. So if you have to sell three listings, if you have to earn $30,000 and your average commission is $10,000, have six listings at all times, probably five, but six is better. That way, you know pretty much like clockwork, you're going to have on average of three closings per month just from those listings selling. Are you understanding what I'm saying here? If you want to know what your business plan is, I just gave it to you. Figure out how much money you have to earn divided by 12, divided by your average commission. And that's the number of listings you need at all times. Now, your the hard part is building up to that magic number of listings, building up to the six listings at all times. But then your whole business plan, your entire life is only about replacing the listings that sell. If you choose not to worry about all the other things that everyone tells you you need to worry about your branding and your marketing and your social media and all the other things because you are really good at going after expired or you're going at, at your centers of influence or whatever and you know your whole business plan and your whole financial future, your sense of security is all predicated on having six listings at all times, just focus on that. I'm even going to drill down even further and this is where the magic really tr starts to happen. Julie and I, who've done literally hundreds of thousands of coaching calls, can attest to this weird psychology that I don't clearly understand. If your goal, if your tr a real estate treasure map requires that you have six listings at all times, ready for it? If you make six solid contacts, decision-making adults about buying or selling real estate, ideally selling because we're focusing on listings, you will have six listings at all times. If you, and Maybe it's seven, right? You don't a pin too much. You're on talking it, about on their daily schedule. You're right. not talking about uh, which like is per what month or something. Which is right. right. Which is yeah. your point number seven. Yeah. So every single day, if you have to have six listings at all times, your minimum standard, and Julie's going to talk about the schedule, is to make uh, six contacts to sellers, expireds for sale by owners, all the different ways, all the different sources of you know motivated sellers we uh, teach you to prospect to in our premier coaching program, but six solid contacts every single day using our scripts, using our systems, using our pre-listing pack, using our pre-qualification system, using our listing presentation, all of it. You're going to build up to six listings at all times. And then your whole job becomes to obviously position those houses correctly in the market to sell. And on average, three of them will sell per month. So your new daily effort is going to focus on replacing the listings that sold. And if you maintain an average of six listings, maybe some weeks or some months, it's eight, maybe some months it's four, but at the end of the year, I promise you, you will blow all of your hopes and your aspirations and your goals out of the water. And when I ask you the question at the end of the year, what you're most proud of, it's going to be actually having listened to today's podcast, downloading the treasure map when you became a premier coaching client and actually taking action on this information. Point number seven. Point number seven is your daily schedule. How are you going to actually make those contacts that Tim was just talking about? What daily schedule must you not just have? I know some of you have a schedule. I know some of you even have it posted on your wall or it's in your computer. You have to actually follow it in order to achieve the results that your goals require of you. How do you figure this out? Tim just told you about that. Start with the following rule. If you are not an experienced listing agent, if you're just starting, this is your basic math, and then you can adjust accordingly like Tim did. You know how to take listings, concentrate on getting to six, or maybe your magic number is 10 active listings at all times. Ours was, by the way, when we sold real estate, ours was like 30. Yes. Well, I'll give you an example. And you just interviewed him not that long ago, John Walkinshaw. Yeah. Who's on track to make more than a million GCI. Okay. Now the difference between two years ago and now is he has had to more than double 
his number of listings. In order for him to achieve the same income, he's had to have more listings because there's more ten, competition. Right. I have 10. We think it's going to be 15 probably. So John Walkinshaw needs to have 15 active listings at all times to sell an average of how many per month? Uh, it's probably six or so. And that's just on the listing side, right? That's, he's very much a listing agent. Right. Yes. So we're not even talking about working buyers. And this is where a lot of you guys are completely confused is you waste way too much time spending way too much money buying buyer leads. Just learn to be a powerful listing agent. And the beautiful thing is, is the market, it, the industry, you know, tries to fill the uh, heads of agents into thinking that becoming a listing agent, you know, a thousand times harder than becoming a buyer's agent. It's not true, especially now with the new commission sharing lawsuit uh, guidelines, yeah, frankly, now. it's just as hard to work with buyers as it is to sellers. So would you rather have, you know, work, have five or six listings at all times, or would you rather have 20 buyers? Of course, you'd rather have the listings. So that's what we primarily yeah. focus on in Premier Coaching. So just go to premiercoaching.com or text the word Premier to 47372. And remember, all of our notes are available. You have to download them. Uh, you'll get them for free. Send to you uh, off our uh, daily newsletter. The link to join is in the show description for today. Julie? Okay, so start with this baseline math. If, you're, if you want to do 12 deals this year, you've got to do at least 12 contacts per day. As your skills increase, you can become more like John up in Canada, more like your example, where you make six powerful contacts knowing that you're talking to potential sellers, okay? So that's the kind of drill down that you get from coaching because it depends on who you're talking to, what your skill level is, what your presentation skills are, et cetera. But if you wanna start somewhere, your daily number of contacts has to equal the number of deals you want to do. A contact is a conversation with a decision-making adult well, the about real estate. The daily contact equates to the number of listings that you want to have at all times. You see how Julie says it slightly differently, but it's getting you to the same point. Julie, the way she's saying it, takes into account that maybe you want to work some buyers. I personally, if I were coaching you, would say just focus on becoming a powerful listing agent and I'll take you to the next level. You can refer those buyer leads out for 30%. Uh, Zillow is charging or more. flex agents 40%. So if you didn't want to work buyers anymore, if you want your, your nights and your weekends back, unless you really you know some of your buyers you want to work, uh, our top coaching clients, we always insist that they frankly cherry pick maybe two or three, usually two really stellar, usually very high end buyers that they're going to work with at all times, yeah. but they have to focus all their best energies on their listing side of things because it's predictable. You wake up in the morning. You, you do your lead generation, you build up your magic number of listings, you know, like clockwork, you're going to have a certain number sell that every month. And the buyers that pour in from those uh, listings, which you will get tons of buyer leads from those listings, refer those out to other agents. Most of the agents in your marketplace won't have any clue how to chase sellers. So they're always just mm -hmm. going to be buyers agents their entire careers. Now, if you want to build a team, there's a great way to generate leads. If you're over at eXp Realty, there's a great way to get agents part of your group, uh, your revenue share group. Expand your thinking with your prominent thoughts focused on being a powerful listing agent. Always lead with listings. It's where all the control lies. And yep. the way you describe it, you know, maintaining your own listing inventory that drives the number of transactions to close, you know, that is the lifestyle to be desired. That's what you do. Even like, you know, I, I was using John as an example. At 15 actives, he's working with one or two buyers. That's it. And they're almost always sellers who are going to buy with him. Maybe they're downsizing. He works with a lot of people in the high end. And every now and then he gets a referral from some past client whose kid is a first time buyer and he just wants to help him out. So that's the lifestyle that you're going after. Though I think he's giving those right now to his daughter, to be honest. Yes, absolutely. And yeah. that's a great way to, to raise a powerful real estate agent too. Yep. Okay. Number eight, your skills. What are your strengths and weaknesses? Take this assessment to find out what needs the most work. Are you a proactive lead generator? This means that you can create business without buying it or with very little expenditure. That's what it means to be a proactive lead generator. Do you have and use a proven listing presentation and now, more important than ever, buyer presentation? Do you follow up on your leads furiously fast using lead follow-up scripts? Do you pre-qualify 100% of your leads, whether they're buyers or sellers, doesn't matter what source they came from, using lead follow-up scripts? Do you have and send your proven pre-listing package 100% of the time with predictable and duplicatable results? Do you understand and maintain your magic number of listings? Do you actually list 90% of the listing appointments you take or better? That's a quick skills assessment. Of course, there's more skills than that, but that, that's the basic stuff because if you're not using a proven pre-listing package, listing presentation, buyer presentation, and you're not getting results, maybe you have them, but you're not really clear on how to present with it yet, 
then you need to work on your skills. Well, you do need to join Premier Coaching and we'll work on your skills with you. So just go to premiercoaching.com or text the word Premier to 47372. Hopefully we have educated you. Hopefully we've motivated you. Now it's your turn and your time to get into action. Please, please, please remember what we told you. You, Your new year has already started. You cannot wait for January 1st to roll around. Otherwise, you're going to be building momentum at the same time all your competitors are. And it's going to be a hell of a lot harder to get those listings and get those contracts. So do it now and you will have lots of momentum growing into next year. If you wait, what's going to happen is that you're going to, you know, rekindle the relationships. You're going to start, uh, you know, making, doing the proactively generation. Let's say you get some appointments. When are those things going to sell? April or May, right? When are the buyers going to buy? Sometime in the late spring versus if you actually did that work now in January, in February, you'll have closing because you can build your momentum off that. This gives you, working this time of year, essentially gives you three extra months to really nail your goals for the following year. Take this stuff seriously, guys, because you are in the right place at the right time, provided you take the right actions. And yes, this time of year is the best time to take some of those actions. Do what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level, guys. It really does pay off. Have a fantastic day. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.